Say the, you take a 500 hectare estate, that will be about uh, 500 at two workers per hectare, we'll have 1,000 workers like what you said. Of the 1,000 workers who are on roll, it is 65 to 70 percent out of what we get now. So out of the 1,000, you are having only 700, right. Out of this 700 is a work site. This 500 hectare property, say it has 50 percent VP. It can have 60, it can have 40. In this percentage of VP, they are high yielding and fully economical to pluck at the current wage rate at 20, 30 kilos average. Keep that 200 hectares for plucking on estate account on wage. You have another 300 hectares. That 300 hectares will have seedling fields which are not altogether economical to pluck because there are very few stands. There are maybe 6,000, 4,000, 5,000 bushes per hectare, whereas the VP had 12,000. That's how it became uneconomical. So you divide this land which is uneconomical to pluck with all the overheads of, uh, that goes on to be done by the company. Yeah. Poor area which is still tea which is yielding, you give, now say there is a family, two people are working. Now you know that 200 hectares you want these two people to work for at least three days of the week or four days of the week. This area you can allow plucking for two days. How much can two or four, two hands, two people, pluck in a week, 2,000 bushes, 3,000 bushes. So you divide 3,000 bushes. Now the 3,000 bushes may be over 2 hectares, because sand per hectare is less. So it's not land per se that you are giving, they are land, you are giving productive tea bushes to these people, 3,000 bushes for this couple. There is another family which has the father-in-law, mother-in-law living with them, two of them plus two of these people, there are four people. Give them four into two, eight thousand bushes. The eight thousand bushes normally should be in one hectare, but because of the sand, it may be in two hectares. So that in fact, once when I told Mr. Metal Fernando and he asked me at that time, how much do you think these contractors are earning? I said maybe about six thousand. He said, Dan, 6,000 is not a living wage. Give them something which is sustainable. So I said, sir, I would like to give them the sustainable tea by tea itself. So what did we do? We gave them the tea plants. Theory is company owns the land, company owns the bush. The outgrower owns the crop. And we have a buyback guarantee to buy that crop. But the land can't be given to anybody. It's common land which we have. The bush is mine. Therefore, I give the plants free to him. I don't charge for the plants. He holds and he puts the plants. And I can tell you at Veldandura when we did this, the plants that the smallholder planted, he used to carry a bucket of water and water it during the drought which I planted on estate account, I had to employ workers to water that. And if I didn't water, it died. The proprietary interest in the smallholder or this uh, contractor, his wife, his little child with a pail of water, went and poured water. And that, so what happened? There was say 4,000 bushes that we counted and gave them. This 4,000 bushes was over 2 hectares maybe. Of, what, 10,000 bushes in 3 hectares. They started infilling block by block to increase productivity of their land with tea. Of course, you have to plant and wait for two, one, two years in the low country, three years in the up country. Therefore, what I did was, I encouraged them to grow. Now, one tea bush is here, one tea bush is somewhere else, and that's why they go to Kola in between. Lanka Organics gave me a buyback guarantee of all the good I can produce. 
So, by intercropping the land with something else, it was not a total failure, it was not a total success. Then I thought of okay, uh, we have to demarcate these blocks also. No? Let us give them ericanut plants to plant on the boundaries of their block. We buy back the ericanut. Dilma no Kahata plantation said no, no uh, earthly use for ericanut. But there was a huge demand for ericanut. If you sold ericanut as ericanut, you are being a fool. Kavata plantations or Dilma were fluent enough to buy the chippers or whatever, packet them hygienically, Pakistan. So there are ways and means of increasing the livelihood income of this piece of land that you are giving them. It need not be only tea for the time being. It can be other things that will grow in that land. Buyback price was very simple. There is a buyback price mechanism now in Sri Lanka for buying bot leaf. So, if at that time my bot leaf price was 40 rupees, I paid the outsider 40 rupees, I paid this guy 30 rupees. For the reason I own the land, I own the tea bush. Therefore, I discounted it. I gave him 30 bucks. Some people are giving the entire 40, but I do not know, uh, whatever. And when I paid him 30 rupees, he had to weed, prune, tip and pluck and give me the tea. I did not take on any other cost. Now, if I was going to take that cost and also now the small hold, I do not go and weed his land and uh, prune his land and fertilize his land. He brings and gives me same thing. You do everything. Fertilizer, yes, I will give it to you. Recover it from the money that is due to you by the supply of green leaf in two installments, three installments, so what? It's a fertilizer supply will give you two months credit, three months credit, anyway. So you just pass it on to them. So it is workable, but it requires a lot of time, effort, and connectivity with the people. For that, you must know the language. If you are in the up country, you must know your Tamil. If you are in the low country, you must know your Singhala. Singhala is not an issue. How many planters can talk Singhala in Tamil fluently? In the good old days, the British planter spoke very, very fluent Tamil. He could read, he could talk. Today, how many can? I am insisting that young Planters coming into the industry must pass their language examination. Most of them do not. The connectivity has to come by dignity and be able to speak to them. Saying that no sir, they understand singular. That is not the point. If he is a Tamil and if you want to talk to him and if you want to convince him and there are certain conceptual things you want to tell him, you can't talk broken Tamil and broken singular. There are certain conceptual things he has to understand the, the way you are saying it. He goes to the union, the union guy is not very good at I mean, he says, in Nada, and he tells him in the language he understands. How can management talk? Communication gap is a big problem. Less and less planters are fluent in the language of their workers. Single is not an issue. Low country, even the Tamil workers know singular. But still, if you are going to talk to them something about a, a, a conceptual thing that you are going to change after 150 years, you can't go and talk to them in a language which is alien. They will suspect that suspicion comes. But you talk to them in good Tamil. They, okay, they relate to you better. So the bridges of understanding even after 150 years, uh, dignity, is that things that the worker is still grumbling about. I was having a chat with a salesman, this Pusel meat shops are all over the place in Colombo. One of the boys who are working uh, over there, was working on a, is living on a plantation that I used to VA years ago. So I said, what on earth are you doing here? You get so much, you know, on a plantation. He said, no, no point, sir. no recognition. Because I could have spoken the language, I asked him, what do you mean by recognition? Because recognition is different things to different people.
I said, aren't you given shoes and you are given uniforms and you are given caps? <laughs> he smiled at me and said, okay, sir, look at me. I am having a uniform, even here. I am working in the air-conditioned compound. And, uh, and the uh, manager, when he comes in, he speaks to me by name. Small, small things which are not connecting. Which connected earlier? As a creeper, I had to know the name of every single worker on the check road because I had to mark check road every evening. Today, where is the custom? How many people does the manager know by name? How many pluckers does the manager know by name? He will know the names of two or three troublemakers. The others, we are working, it's a hearts and minds game. 70 percent, 80 percent of our cost of production is people. We say people are greatest asset. Do we know them by name? So there are some basics that we need to uh, inculcate. The other day I was going on the property, I asked the manager, why aren't your workers uh, wearing slippers? Because you are talking about anemia and you are giving them worm treatment and you are giving them iron. I said, all the iron in the world is of no use because they are getting reinfected by not footwear. He said, yes, sir. They, you, normally they wear, sir. So I stopped and asked that lady, how come you are not wearing your footwear? She said, it was raining today. It was slippery, so I didn't wear, but normally I have. In the plucking field, even if they come wearing slippers, inside the field, they are bare feet. That is where the reinfection starts. So I have recommended that the company talks to Bata. I did this when I was manager on SPL. Bata made a mold with a back strap, the normal Bata slipper, with a back strap, so that the slipper doesn't go all over the place. It's firmly to your feet when you're going on that terrain. Uh, what they will do, I don't know. I have still not followed up on that. But these are the small, small interventions that we require. There are a few others. Uh, if I were to uh, mention all that now, uh, like Lord Buddha said, when I point one finger at them, three fingers are pointing at me. What the hell were you doing for 44 years? You, you were part of the system. Uh, of course, uh, results, I can say, okay, the results, but nowhere near what the people are looking at dignity. They want much more. But they don't want jaguars to go around the field. They don't want um, fancy stuff. Just hearts and minds, connectivity. Engage them. Engagement. There is very little engagement between the worker and management. When I used to call them associates at whatever level, they knew they had to share their estate vision and mission. They had it on a piece of paper in Tamil language. They could have told you, so our vision in this company is this. We won 13 awards in a year, national, international and regional. So many inspectors came and asked workers all over the place, what is your vision, what is your for productivity, uh, national productivity, national quality, national safety. So they were engaged in this. They, they said, why shouldn't you uh, spit uh, here and there? They should have said, that is hygiene. We don't do that even at home now. That's the kind of answer you want. But you can, you can have no spitting boards all over. But they don't know why they are not spitting and why whatever. So it's not rocket science. It is people. And if we can engage with them more. But 23 to 28 percent of the staff card on a plantation is health welfare. It's the biggest department in the, in the, on an estate. You take a 500, uh, 500 hectare estate, there's uh, four divisions, four crash attendants, one midwife, one family welfare supervisor, one medical assistant, seven or eight people in the health welfare department. You go to a division, you get two field officers. You go to the factory, uh, factory you get one factory officer, two assistant factory officers, and three supervisors. The highest division department is health welfare but we are not making use of them to relate with the people. Not that they are understaffed, 
But then again, that staff must know the language to talk. You pair them up with the staff who can't really talk that language. Again, they are in a cocoon. They are only doing immunization, weighing the child. That's all. If the weight of the child is less, they can't explain to the mother and say, "Look, your baby has been doing fine while you are breastfeeding, but now uh, child is getting bigger. You can't now only give breast milk, but give some pepper juice or egg yolk." You must know the language to talk to a mother and say, "This is what you should be doing." That's like. So there is uh, a lot of scope. This industry is not going to collapse tomorrow, but we need to do things different. Can't do the same things that we did and didn't do in the last 10-20 years of complacency and expect it to go on. To change, get back to what we used to do: hearts and minds games, and call people by name, this and that, and engage them. Have this model where they have a proprietary interest in the place that they are working in. We have a booming industry.